All right. Good morning. I'm Jean-Marie Aligad. I'm the manager of uh, TND Design Engineering at APS. Been there for about 15, 16 years. Started in the company as a drafter uh, in the world of design, of course. And I'm joined here by my colleague. Go ahead, Justin. Good morning, everybody. I'm Justin Giles. I'm the Design Center Supervisor, um, also kind of taking the lead for our AUD implementation under Jean-Marie's wonderful guidance. Uh, I've been with APS for about 21 years now total, starting in the design ranks, doing all kinds of different levels of design and project management and into this role. So lots to offer here. Awesome. Thank you. And so today we're presenting our move to intelligent design. And we haven't really seen the presentation either. Just kidding. No. <laughs> All right. So a journey of a thousand miles starts with one single step. Some people are doubting that. That's scary. <laughs> okay. So, so today we're really here to talk about our journey so far. And, um, you know, what does it really take? What does it really take to start? And uh, what do you think that picture is there? Come on, somebody. What? Louder. Mount Rainier. Yes, that's from our trip to the pug in Seattle. So I'm going to take it a little bit back. And so what does it take? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that guy? That's you. That's right. I pulled that out way back. So it starts with curiosity. And, and the picture on the left, um, it's probably 12 or maybe 10 years ago, um, I was doing a, a little demo. Uh, I actually went to the design center. I didn't work there. And Jason uh, had the pleasure to show me what AUD was. So APS actually had AUD over a decade ago. Um, and, and they had really great results. It was like a little tiny pilot that they ran. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't really uh, pan out, right? So back when I had the then the honor to be at the design center as a supervisor, our designers and our teams continue to talk about AUD. And it's like, I know what AUD is. I know it's a really cool tool. And why are we using it, right? So curiosity and some action. It takes some action. So I went to my boss, uh, my manager at the time, and I said, hey, this, there's this really cool tool that we wanted to use like 10 years ago. We didn't really get to use it. Um, can I bring the team to a conference? And so he said yes. And I grabbed some people, uh, some of the best designers that we had at the time, and we headed out to our first pug. So um, that's us in the plane. Um, so we, we sat here at the pub, just like some of you that are new uh, to, to the conference, and we absorbed all the information, all the presentations, met a lot of people. And, and I want to kind of dial it back to how do you, once you absorb all this information, all this cool stuff, how do you go back establish that buy-in? How do you go back and sell it to the people that need to fund your project, right? Because we knew, we knew we wanted this tool, but we needed to get some other people on board. So think back about your company's biggest challenges. And so these are, I'm sure, will be the same to you. Inconsistent use of standards. Today, we not only have our design center, but we also have local offices throughout our state. And with that geographic um, distance um, and leadership, different organizational structure, there's going to be people that are going to do things kind of in their own way. So there is inconsistent use of standards. We rely a lot on cheat sheets and, you know, tools, spreadsheets, things like that. Um, we use multiple programs, and you heard me earlier talk about our users having to go from one tool to the next, to the spreadsheet, to the whatever. And that's bad from a user experience perspective. Um, backlog mapping, uh, backlog of mapping our as -built. So I'm going to touch on this real quick because we are an S3 uh, ArcFM um, company. And so 
Today, a lot of our asphalts for our facilities get routed to us uh, electronically, but there are scanned copies of PDFs. And so they go to this inbox where our mappers are waiting <laughs> to map. And, you know, when you've got thousands of jobs coming at you, there's going to be a backlog that builds up. So for that reason, our backlog can go anywhere from 30 days to a few months. And we are also using ADMS, so which is a Schneider product. So our ADMS depends highly on our GIS information. So if we don't have that information in a timely manner, then now you don't have visibility to the facilities that you just built. So it, that is a problem. And uh, manually entering data multiple times. I mean, we know, we, uh, I heard earlier from Dennis, he was saying there's a lot of investment, right? And we are seeing that, not just the growth in Phoenix being the, one of the number one counties, Maricopa County in, in the country, but also the investment that's happening. And, you know, let's be honest, we're not gonna get a lot of people, just heck count. Um, so we have to figure out ways to work smarter. Um, and so with that said, today's problem is we, a lot of our stuff, we enter it over and over again, and we don't want that. So what we gathered from the conference was, well, what can we achieve? So we can achieve consistency, right? Uh, a consistent use of our compatible units, um, automated design, design rules to help with that consistency, integration with Maximo, um, and some of you are SIP SAP users, but we use Maximo, uh, but also integration with GIS, um, push design to GIS with one click is what we call it, and reduce time to do tasks. So there's a lot of really great benefits that the tool presented to us. Um, going a little bit further, when we did a, a try to build a business case and actually put it into numbers. I just wanted to throw some numbers in there so that you could see the magnitude for us. Uh, saves about 29,000 hours of mapping in a year. That's from going from manually drawing, redrawing every single job to just getting it from AUD. And the other big one is reducing the design time. So that varies between 11 to 40%, depending on the role, uh, because we do have designers that just do design and we have other roles that do design every now and again. So, um, but that is calculated between three to $6 million of avoided cost every year. Um, so just kind of to paint the picture for you of the benefits that we are saying we could bring with the tool. All right, so here's my chicken scratch. These are my notes from the pug. <laughs> and, and, you know, we're here, we're gonna talk about technical stuff all day, but the people back at home or in the office that don't do the stuff that you do, they don't understand mo most of that stuff. So you have to make it simple for them. And the other thing is you need to tie it not to just your individual challenges, but your company's challenge. Think bigger. How do you get the buying of your president, your CEO, your vice president? You have to tie it into the larger company goals. And so um, as APS, our APS promise, right, and our mission is to serve our customers clean, reliable, and affordable energy, right? We wanna create a sustainable future for our customers in Arizona. And so how do we tie all these benefits we just talked about to our company's mission? And so to deliver clean, reliable, and affordable energy, we need better data. That's what everybody's talking about nowadays, right? Better data so that we can drive better decisions, accuracy. AUD brings us accuracy. Um, we need to give operations visibility um, to changes in our facilities. So that's another, from a safety perspective, situational awareness, and our ability to manage the grid is giving your operations teams faster visibility to your designs, whether that is electrical, gas, what, whatever it is, right? Um, and we need consistency in design. And why do we want that? Not just because we love design standards, right? Um, but for our customers, if you're having consistent designs and you're estimating designs that are consistent, then all your customers are getting kind of 
the same product, the same bill at the end of the day. You don't want to, you know, give one bill to one developer and another one to another developer because eventually it will come back to haunt you, I promise you. Um, so consistency in design benefits our customers. Um, and not mention, it also saves lots of money like I showed you in the last slide. So I hope that kind of helps you understand how we went from chicken scratch and curiosity and trips to the pug to establishing buy-in to our company. And I'm gonna kick it off to Justin to tell you more about our team and our project. Go ahead. All right, so once we started getting into this project, we got, our, got everything we needed. First thing we did was we had to build our team. So we went through and we're thinking, okay, so we've got various organizations or departments across the organization. Let's grab representatives from all of these areas to be part of this team. So we have five SMEs that have been working with us from the beginning to help us build this tool, to be that sounding board, to figure out what we need, how we need to build it, what we need to do, what looks good, what does good look like going forward. Just because we've always done it this way today doesn't mean that's how we need to have to do it tomorrow. So we've got the five guys that have been crucial in thinking outside that box and really looking for that really cool stuff. And all five of them are here with us today, glad to say. So that's kind of where we started. We started building those requirements with that thought in mind, thinking that what can we do? What do we want this to look like? How do we want it to work? What functionality are we looking for? And kind of working through getting all those bits and pieces put together and then and documented into our requirements building. As we were going through this, one of the things that we found was that we were lacking a lot of documentation within our design standards. We just, we had our designer handbook that had bits and pieces, but it was wildly out of date and needed to be updated and expanded. So that was kind of task number one for us. We jumped into that, started working through that. We put a committee together to do that, to build that, worked with another a vendor to help us do all this, get everything built to a point where we had a solid foundation to start building our design of the program from. We're still working on building that all today, but it's more or less, we've got the main pieces, now we can get into the details and the weeds as we're going. And as we're getting into the design, those become present and we keep building and running and going from there. So one of the things that we did as doing this was we established a cadence of meetings to start us off. We met twice a week for two hours, the entire, the entire SME team. And we would talk about the build. We'd talk about the standards that we were meeting, things we needed to change in workflows, working through all these bits and pieces and having the SBS team and the Atwell team helping us through that, working some of these things out, asking them questions saying, hey, can AUD do this? Most of the time they'd say, yeah, we think so. And it was true, they could get it. And so asking those questions and really meeting together was a critical point for us as we were going through the build piece, which we still are. Another big piece that we had to do was within our GIS system. So we have kind of a sister project going along with this one that we're calling conflation. And it's something that needs to be done within our GIS uh, system. The, the way that we're currently using our GIS is it's not, everything's not in there to true real world. So it's, there's a, an offset, a little bit of a difference in where it's shown in GIS to where it actually lives in the real world. And that has to be corrected. So we've got that effort up and going. We're about halfway done with it right now where we're going through our entire GIS program and fixing everything making it all real world and updating our maps and making everything usable so that way as we're pulling data in to AUD, we're getting good data. We're not getting this messed up data that now we have to correct and fix in AUD and then sending this good data back to a GIS system that's not gonna be able to do anything with it because it doesn't match. So having all of that corrected and fixed and up and running was a real critical piece for us to get going into this. So. Lots happening there. A lot of benefits from what I've heard from the design teams there too, outside of just the design tool. 
So another piece that, why are we looking into this was another piece was the integrations. Uh, Jean-Marie was really good at asking a lot of those questions about integrations. And we're integrating with Maximo on top of GIS. This is a really big time saver for our team. Right now, most of our teams have to do their design, build their CU, CU list, manually take that over, put that into Maximo, into CUE, and build their estimate from there. The integration with Maximo that we're building is gonna allow us to auto-build our CUs as we're doing our design, have that list auto-generated, and then at the push of a button, send it to Maximo and build it, and so it auto-builds in CUE. Saving all that time, saving all the duplication of effort, and the human error side of things where something accidentally gets missed. Make, taking all of that guesswork out of it, making it much easier to use and to work through. And it's also gonna help us with the standardization of these things, because we're gonna be able to build the rules into these CUs, so that way it's AUD's picking what we're asking it to pick. So that way we take that guesswork out of it from the multiple different designers and the multiple different departments and doing things differently helping bring that standardization together. Another benefit of the Maximo integration is that it allows us to get other data into, into AUD from Maximo. So we use Maximo as our work order tracking uh, program, our system of record for all of that. And within there, there's a lot of data, like a work order number, a project name, an address, township and range information. All this gets put into the Maximo system and is sitting there. That all has to be duplicated onto our designs. With this integration, we're able to pull all that data right into the design and have it auto update and work for us. So we're not having, again, having to do that manual double entry. Again, saving a lot of time for the designers, making things easier. Allowing them to focus on the design versus all the associated stuff that has to go into it for the, the paperwork. I talked a little bit about the GIS piece coming in and how that's gonna work and what that allows us to do. And it, it really is on top of bringing in that good data, it's going to bring in everything as AUD entities. So it takes a lot of the, the guesswork out of what's existing in the field today. Where does this really go? What do I need to start my design? It gives that solid base point for when you're working in AUD. You can bring in that data, it comes over as smart entities, already ready to go, working, all you have to do is take off and run from there. Adds a lot of value into that, into that whole starting point of the design, takes a lot of that guesswork away. The other piece that we're really happy about is the, the, the connected model ability within AUD. That allows us to not only take take that automation piece to a whole nother level. Because like Jean-Marie mentioned, today we have this spreadsheet that does these load calculations, this program that calculates this over here. And our design teams have to go into all these different areas while they're doing their design to figure out what it is they need within their design. With that connected model, we're able to have a lot of that auto running behind the scenes. So as we're putting in our equipment and running the wires between, it's checking our pulling calcs making sure that the route we're planning is working. If it's not, it's gonna say, hey, you've got a problem here. You're exceeding your parameters that you've set. Or, hey, your voltage drop and flicker. That's not gonna work. That wire's too long or too small or something's wrong here. You need to look at this. So it's giving us that ability to stay in the AUD program and working and solely focusing on that. And, our, and what we're building there, not having to worry about bouncing all over the place and having those distractions come in. Along with that, after we get our design done, the cool thing is that, I, kind of like I mentioned, we're able to push back into GIS. With the data all being in real world, can, you know, real world locations, coming out of GIS, lit, holding those coordinates in AUD, when we push it back, we're able to put it right back in and have a clean model. This also allows us to get, like Jean-Marie mentioned, that more real-time data. We'll be able to push things back in faster and get things in there so that way our operators actually have a more accurate system to work on within our GIS and ADMS systems, giving them a whole lot more visibility to what's actually going on.
So uh, Justin actually just showed you a brief, uh, a brief version of our roadshow deck. So everything that he went through our why we're using the screenshots is the actual presentation that we used internally to start our change management, which I want to talk to you about. Um, building excitement and managing change, it sounds easy, it sounds fun, but it's really tough. <laughs> you have to really be in it for the long run. And, and so I talked to you earlier about establishing buy-in. And one of the, the first things to do is having your champions, right? You have your champions in your SME team, but establishing those champions at the highest level. And so one of the very first things that I did is I met with our vice president of operations and I made up some like shanky presentation with screenshots of our demo and I showed it to him. I was like, this is what we want to do and this is what we want to accomplish. And he was on board right away. Um, the other thing is, uh, so we talked about establishing the team in the business. And of course, I couldn't say that we have some people in the IT side that are also supporting us. Greg Cernich, I think is online. He couldn't come today. Um, our design spatial team, um, our project manager, Dave Schlanger, he's right there. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, so part of that, I wanted to touch on this piece because Pat alluded to our journey. So on the APS side, we've probably had seven or eight project managers. Yeah, it's been a rough ride to tell you. Um, and so having that core team in the business, your, your, you know, your SMEs, your champions, and having that continuity of somebody that's carrying the torch, it's very important because you are going to face challenges within the project schedule, the budget, you know, things are going to happen within your organization. And part of adapting is making sure that people that are your champions and stay, they stay connected, they stay, you know, we keep going no matter what. And so that that team is very important. Um, uh, Justin alluded to the consistency in our meetings and our communication. So we have two pretty large projects. So we talked about the conflation project, which is um, basically moving our entire facilities in the state of Arizona. It's a really large project. And so we needed some professionals to come in and help us. And internally, we have a communication team, a change management team. They usually work in really large projects, but hey, ask for help. You know, if there are experts out there that know how to put a nice presentation together, a nice newsletter, um, that have done this stuff before, ask for help. Maybe they're not 100% dedicated to your project, but if they can consult, you know, give you a little help, that helped us tremendously because the presentation that we showed, you know, that was in our template. They put it together for us, and, and it, it, it's nice when it's a nice thing to see and you read things that make sense, you know. All those little tiny things are very important. Um, our road shows. So uh, we rolled out AUD. We, we kicked it off and then we went to the pandemic. So that was a little tough. Uh, the pandemic was tough for all of us, but we've had 24 virtual road shows, 24. So we've pres presented 24 times. Um, it's not just um, me, you know, we kind of tag team it. Um, so we, because we couldn't be there everywhere at once, but you making the time to show people what's coming, showing him, showing them with pictures, even if you don't have the tool in your hands, that goes a long ways because when people just read words on a slide, that doesn't mean anything, especially if you're talking to uh, technical people, they got to be able to see it. So, so that uh, would be my, my recommendation to you. Um, and, and the last little piece there is we talk to everyone we know about AUD. Anyone and everyone, whether they cared or not, they knew what AUD was. Hey, well, so how are you doing? Well, I'm working on AUD. What's AUD? And tell them supply chain, whoever, HR, environmental, whoever I could talk about the product, talk about what you're doing. 
sell it. I mean, you have you have to be your own champion for your product. And so I see those happy faces right there. Marty um, in there is he's back there, and uh, Matt has helping us a lot with the configuration. Jesse and we cut off Greg somehow, but um, it's that's our team right there. Um, Cody. Um, so, anyways, just wanted to say uh, building the excitement. Uh, it's it's a lot of work, but it's also just as important as building your tool and your product. So so just remember that. So where are we going from here? We're currently in our build phase. We've got a lot of things. So what's on the horizon for us? So kind of looking back at where we've come from so far, having that support system, like Jean Marie mentioned, having those SMEs, that's a really important piece keeping that out of the box thinking going, you know, continually to looking for areas that you can improve as you're doing your build. Um, and really having those good design standards already set up, ready in place for your build. Those are some of the really, the really big things. And you know what, like I mentioned in the last bullet there, don't limit yourself on your integrations. Think about it. Ask. All the worst they can do is say, no, we can't do that, right? So best to ask and try for it. Make those integrations happen. Make it easier for the people. That's kind of the thought process. So keeping going, we're going to keep working through the rest of our build. We've got uh, probably hopefully next year we'll be done and ready to deploy, hopefully, fingers crossed. Continuing that change management, it's an ongoing piece, keeping everybody aware of what you're doing, where you're at, letting them see those updated visuals of what you've built, the cool little things that they're going to get to use when you get this deployment done. We're going to be looking into getting that configuration with OCALC. That's a big one for us. And then, uh, you know, continuing to think forward, even after our initial deployment. We're already lining up some things that, all right, our next release, you know, maybe a year later after we do our initial deployment, this is what we want to work on to get out to the next group. Getting into some 3D stuff, making, making things even better, getting more tools for the designers to be able to use. So don't stop thinking just, all right, we're, we've got it out, we're done. Keep thinking. This is an amazingly powerful tool. It's got a lot to offer. So keep thinking forward in that space too. That's it. So thank you. Do you have time for questions? <laughs> Uh, so on the conflation, is is there any thoughts or discussions that you might be able to share about whether the designers can fix things and use kind of like an existing modified status versus the GIS having to fix things? I know that's a big decision point for a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the question is on the GIS, have we thought about whether designers can fix things? And then what was the second part? Conflation. Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit into the weeds here. So I was a manager of GIS, you know, for a little bit. Um, and so Conflation is a project that we've been trying to do for over a decade. Uh, we More than that, since we had it, basically, and realized that, oops, it's not where it's supposed to be. <laughs> so anyways, uh, we've tried to fix that for many, many years, and... Um, it was an O&M expense. So with AUD coming in, we had the opportunity to make it a capital investment. So that is one AUD was enabled us to fix these. I mean, one can't be without the other. There is so many benefits from uh, GIS being where it's supposed to be, enabling mobility tools with collector and survey one, two, three, and all that good stuff, right? Um, and we want to go there. I mean, we're already there, but it's not working properly because the facilities are not where they're supposed to be. So anyways, so that's kind of like the background. Um, it would be too much to ask each designer. We don't have that many designers. Uh, we have about 33 in my organization and maybe 12 more out on the local offices. So there's actually not a lot of designers that we have at APS for 1.2 million customers. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so it would be too much to ask. However, um, there are some things that we are doing as far as better data uh, in GIS. Um, 
So we have a process where it's like, okay, for our conflation, we have a map where we're showing kind of the progress that we're making. Um, right now, we're kind of halfway through the western part of the state. We've done, basically, if you split Arizona in half, kind of the west piece is done. And so we're asking people, hey, if you see that anything's wrong or it doesn't make sense, email this and these people, and there's some analysts that can go in there and fix it. But then we've got another project called GIS uh, Map Field Viewer that is going to enable uh, the crews, um, tr you know, anybody that's doing any field checking to be able to make a markup and then submit it back into um, the, and the mapping team is going to be able to see it on their side um, and make smaller corrections. But for larger infrastructure, like I mentioned, as built, and even when you first design something and you are um we we're you're not release you're releasing it to construction we're going to be able to send that back to um arc fm and, and give them visibility of, hey this is a what we're going to call a pre-map layer um so i i hope that answers your question um thank thank you for that uh the gentleman in the back with his hand first what percent what percent automation are we having from the design to GIS? Oh, mapping requirements. Um, so I from what I understand, and um, my my GIS guru is not here. Um, so from what I understand, uh, the the tool is going to send that information through the playback manager um, to ArcFM, and then there the mapper is going to be able to see the changes that are happening you know, kind of validate, yes, okay, everything looks good, do kind of like a QA, QC control thing, and then, um, you know, push a button and accept it into their session or whatever they're doing. Um, I apologize, I'm not the GIS expert. My husband's not here today to <laughs> talk about that. Okay. On the completion side also is for your data gathering efforts to identify the physical locations, are you using any modern methods like reality capture, mass data gathering, point clouds, mobile light, are those type of tools to do large data set gathering so you can do a lot of the correction in the office with that type of stuff? Is that mm -hmm. on your roadmap? Yeah, um, today we're not doing, so from a data accuracy standpoint, um, all we're doing with conflation is shifting facilities through vectors. So um, it's not like, a, oh, just move it to the right. Uh, there are some companies out there that uh, have methods where they look at existing parcels and we've been mapping all our land base, all our you know parcels and monuments from designs. Um, so they are kind of, they created a whole, I, I don't remember what they called it, but they basically mapped all where every single little corner was going to shift to. So right now the shifting of the facilities is just based on land-based information from the true sources. Um, and once that's done, I'm sure we'll have other efforts to make sure, do we actually have the right conductor labeled and things like that. Um, we're not doing any field checking right now to, to do that. Thank you. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Oh, Dwayne. Hello. Is Pax holding it? No, great presentation. I'm just Thanks. curious, drilling into that, I love the RLI story, the 29,000 hours. Uh -huh. how, how would you, is that primarily attributed to not having to redraw in GIS and mapping? Was that 100% of that, or was that just design efficiencies into no. that 29,000? No, so I actually had, I was, I was very thoughtful about what I was going to put on the slide because generally uh, they say don't put anything that has to do with numbers in there. But I knew that there was going to be other utilities here, and I wanted you to kind of understand that piece. So from a mapping perspective, the savings is the calculated hours that it takes internally to do every job that comes in. Um, so every ticket that comes in. Uh, so all those hours times the number of people that are, you know, that you have and all, all that good stuff. Um, there's actually a number associated with that, but I decided I'm just going to show the hours. So it's all mapping. So all the manual reduction of the 
remapping everything because today the mappers get a drawing and that drawing, it's not like you can copy and paste it into ArcFM. So they have to redraw every single thing and it sucks. So <laughs> having it, you know, just come in, it's just going to be a game changer. And the, and the design piece, um, what you have to think about is if you have contract resources like we do, we use them heavily on for mapping and also for design, for distribution design, very heavily, about 50, 60 50 to 60% of our work is actually outsourced because we don't have the internal capacity. So you have to think about the dollars associated with that. Every hour that you can reduce is capital savings um, for, for you and your company. So you have to think about that too. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Kevin with AP, quick question. The, I was trying to follow how the material was getting ordered from Maximo, mm -hmm. can you maybe describe that in brief? Okay, yes, so funny enough. So um, today uh, in Maximo, we have a compatible unit library. So we have CUs, right? Um, compatible units that have a collection of bill of materials inside of them. And those, um, most people that use Maximo, Maximo is also used for warehouse and, you know, and supply chain activities. So, but we have another program that we're trying to move away from. Anyways, the material ordering happens there, right? You push it to whatever your material uh, ordering dashboard is. So the relationship with AUD is that we, you are able to bring in into your AUD tool, you're able to bring that library. So we can see the entire library inside the design tool. And then as you are, you know, placing a transformer or laying down a, a pipe or whatever, it's gonna pick those compatible units um, from, from that library into your design. And then when you're all done and you have a pretty picture of everything, you know, that's in that list, it's going to push to Maximo, back to Maximo, and then Maximo is going to do the ordering of your material. <laughs>